Hi, I'm Trey Harris, an engineer here at Google New York, and I am very pleased uh, to welcome Jeff Jarvis. Uh, he's director of the uh, Tao Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at uh, the CUNY Graduate School of uh, Journalism, where he's an associate professor. Um, he created Entertainment Weekly magazine in 1990, uh, starting a new format that, unlike Variety or People, didn't focus on the business or the celebrity side, but on the actual criticism of the entertainment itself. Um, he's since consulted for, managed, and advised a number of ventures, including Advanced.net, About.com, Daylife, and many others. Uh, he publicly declined an invitation to join Demand Media's uh, Board of Advisors. Uh, in 2009, uh, Jeff released his first book, uh, What Would Google Do, from HarperCollins. And uh, he launched uh, a weekly video netcast this week, with, uh, this week in Google on the Twit Network, which he co-hosts with uh, Gina Trapani and Leo Laporte. Uh, it covers not only Google, but the cloud, social media, the, what's going on in the internet, and of course, Glee and Chipotle. Uh, the uh, newest book, uh, Public Parts, uh, How Sharing in the Digital Age Improves the Way We Work and Live, uh, has just been released by Simon & Schuster. So most reporters seek to provide an illusion of objectivity by refusing to discuss or disclose anything about their personal lives, their financial interests, their beliefs. But on Jeff's blog, buzzmachine.com, he discloses not only his financial interests in complete detail, but his political and his religious views. And in 2009, uh, he announced his diagnosis with prostate cancer. And uh, he continued to share his uh, experience in treatment in real time as it went on. Uh, in public parts, he writes about how this openness changed his attitudes about privacy and sharing. And uh, he makes a persuasive argument uh, about how public spaces on the net uh, can serve as a powerful social, political, and economic force of change, and why they must be protected. So please thank, uh, welcome Jeff Jarvis. Great, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I am, uh, you know, I. I can claim righteously Google fanboy status, having written a whole book about it. So I, I, I love what you do. I love you all. Uh, and I can say that out loud. Um, so I'm, I'm really honored and delighted to be here. I wouldn't actually come here for lunch with Bob before I did the book, because I didn't want to sign the NDA at the door. I came here only after I finished the book, uh, because it was what will Google do. Uh, but since then, uh, I've been here more and been to Mountain View. And as I say, it, what amazes me about Google is how you default to smart here that every other company I go to and work for, you assume the company's stupid, but here it seems to be different, and I hope it stays that way. So uh, I'm, 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 I, for the fourth time, I'm honored to be here. And thank you, Trey. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, is the merger of technology and change and privacy and fear and then publicness out of that. Because I think that, that what we need to do is change the discussion a bit. Importantly, privacy and publicness are not binary. They are not at war with each other. One depends upon the other. Uh, uh, you, you have your private thoughts that you then choose to make public. Others, public discussions inform your private thoughts. So this is not about being against privacy. Quite the contrary. I believe strongly in the need for privacy and its protection. The reason I wrote the book was that I feared that we were so monomaniacal about privacy that we were going to lose sight of the importance of publicness and the tools of publicness. And Lord knows you here at Google live on and support these tools of publicness, not just at Google+, and, and blogger, but also, in fact, of course, because you connect people to information and each other. And my fear is that if we go crazy about privacy, we'll limit the technology uh, and blame the technology for changes that we don't understand. So I, wanted to, I had to deal first with privacy before I got to publicness. And I found through looking at history, when Gutenberg's press came out, the earliest authors were frightened of the notion of their words now suddenly being associated with their names, set down permanently, distributed widely. Uh, I love this quote from Jonathan Swift, that a copy of verses kept in a cabinet is like a virgin much sought after, but when printed and published is a common whore whom anybody may purchase for half a crown. Uh, so the attitude about publishing originally was fright. Right? Jump forward to the year 1890 and the invention of the Kodak camera. 
This was the reason for the first serious discussion of a legal right to privacy in the United States. Not until 1890 was it discussed. And the, the fear was that people would have portable cameras now tied to the penny press and your image could be everywhere suddenly. And it scared people. It scared uh, the president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. And Kodak became a lowercase word and a, and a Kodaker. There are other quotes I have from the New York Times at the time about fiendish Kodakers lying in wait. Um, such as the effect on the human nerves of continuous exposure. This caused fear. Um, other technologies came along later that caused similar fear. Small microphones, video cameras. Um, Alan Weston feared LSD and you'd say things you wouldn't otherwise say. Uh, the notion that you could put uh, magnetic tattoos on babies. All these things could happen and people feared the results of them. I don't think that doomsday has come in any case. And I don't mean to diminish the concerns people have about technology when it changes their life. And you should think about what bad could happen. You should guard against it. That's fine. But if all we do is manage our lives and our society and our laws and our business to the worst case, we'll never create the best case. You are in the best case business. And so that's why I think this is a bit of a call to arms to beware that the fears could take us over. Uh, but again, the fears are worth considering. Helen Nissenbaum at NYU talks about the problems today of information technology, massive databases. You don't notice databases are never anything but massive. They're always massive, and that makes them scarier. Uh, these things do change how information passes and what happens with them, and we do need to worry about that. You worry about that regularly here. Peter Schar talks about internet attacks and, and biometric IDs and DNA. The important thing about Peter Schar is he is in charge of privacy in Germany. Uh, Germany and Google's relationship is a tender one. And uh, he is probably one of the most frightened people about privacy there, and he stands in a position to do something about it. However, on the other side, we have Douglas Adams, who said that things that are already in the world by the time you're 30 uh, are either normal or exciting. If they're invented after you're 30, they're going to destroy civilization until you understand that they're no big deal. Um, now we have, I would argue, the most disruptive technology ever created. Uh, since perhaps the wheel or at least the Gutenberg press, the internet. And that's what we're involved in. Uh, and as you well know, your street view has caused much surus in Germany. Uh, and you know, I find some irony in that, what I call the German paradox here. Because as you know, uh, Germans came up with the right of fair pixel Ungsrecht, the right to be pixelated in street view. And the head of privacy and consumer protection, actually, in Germany, Ilse Eigner, encouraged Germans to fill out the form to send to Google to be pixelated in Street View. Even though faces and license plates and street addresses were already pixelated, this was to pixelate whole buildings. 244,000 Germans sent in the form, resulting in this. Now, I thought that the Fair Pixel Ungsrecht was funny until I saw it. And I actually think that it is a, it is a tragedy. It is, it is a desecration of the digital landscape of Germany. And you move along in the landscape and you suddenly see this, this blur. Wags on Twitter, uh, who are on my side of this, have redubbed their country Blurmany uh, because of this. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Jens Best who started a site called Finde das Pixel, Find the Pixel. And he encourages people to go to Street View, find the blurred homes, go to the address, take a picture, put it up on Street View and link to it. Uh, yeah, right. Um, but they've gone batshit over privacy in Germany. Now, one could argue that's because of their, of their recent political history, though my grandfather-in-law, bless his heart, was German, and Opa used to always say to us, you mustn't say those things. No one needs to know that. I think it's in the German soul somewhere, and there are differences. But then I went for the first time to the German sauna. Anyone here been in a sauna in Germany? Uh, you know. They are, what's, what's unique about them? It's co-ed and naked. Co-ed and naked, right? So uh, is it mixed? Yes. Is it naked? Yes. And so that leads one to believe that the Germans care deeply about the privacy of everything except, of course, their private parts. It's a cheap joke, I admit it. Um, <laughs> but it does actually make us ask, why is the private private and why is the public public? And if you compare cultures, of course, there are differences. Scandinavians put up their incomes and taxes for all to see as a matter of law. Uh, in Holland, it's said that one must keep one's curtains parted at all times, otherwise your neighbors will wonder what you're up to. Uh, when I went to look for this picture 
for, for this, this presentation, I went to Street View, I went all over Amsterdam, I couldn't find a single open window. I think they knew that the Google Man was coming that day. Um, speaking of which, Google Man, have any of you seen this great uh, uh, video about uh, Street View uh, by ZDF in Germany of Google Home View? It's, it, look it up, it's great. It's in German, but you'll understand the joke anyway. What happens is, along comes Google Man wearing a Google hat and he announces at the door, uh, excuse me, we're, we're Google, we're gonna take pictures now inside your house. And the, 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 the unwitting German couple says, okay, and they say, well, you sit on the couch there, we'll take a picture, and take a picture, and take a picture. Then at one point they decide that they have to worry about the privacy, so they give them what they call pixel boards to put over their eyes. Uh, and it's, 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 it's just great. Then they go to another house, and a woman starts taking a picture of them. And Google man puts the pixel board before his eyes. It's in my privacy. And then, then he says, ah, if you don't cooperate, we'll take away your Google. Um, anyway, uh, in America, we put the faces of, of people who are arrested in, in Europe. They find that, that difficult. Um, we tweeters talk about our breakfast, of course. So it makes you ask, what is privacy? And I found that to be a really difficult question. I had kind of presumed Mark Zuckerberg's definition that it was about control of your information, but it's not that simple at all. It's, it's, it's extremely complex to dig into. Um, originally, the root of the word privacy is to be deprived of public notice. That those who were public were privileged and those who were private were not privileged. So that the reason we call a private in the army a private is because he's not a public, uh, does not have a public office. In the UK, and I never understood this, in the UK they call private schools public schools because they were intended for the, the children of public men, people of stature. And those who were private were, were deprived. Uh, Hannah Arendt says that we're not fully human unless we're public. If you go to the original uh, villages, of course, people lived very publicly around. You knew everybody's business. And privacy didn't really get invented, the argument goes, until the hall and the back stairs were invented. So otherwise, you had to cross into rooms, to other people's rooms, to, to, to do that. Daniel Solov who's an expert on privacy and a very good, good uh, uh, spokesman for the privacy uh, concerns, it confesses, though, that privacy, the word, has come to mean everything and nothing. Uh, another scholar says that it's a chameleon-like word. It's there to generate goodwill, but you don't really know what it means. Uh, Raymond Wax says it's a nebulous concept. Brandeis and Warren, who wrote the piece that was inspired by the Kodak camera in 1890, wrote it in the Harvard Law Review, uh, finally came to the conclusion that privacy is the right to be let alone. Importantly, there is no constitutional or Bill of Rights guarantee of privacy. There is a publicness, it's the First Amendment. The First Amendment says we all have the right to speak. But there's no such guarantee of privacy. And they had to find it and, and in the Fourth Amendment and in other parts of the Constitution, and it had to be made as statutory law as time went on. They also determined that at root, privacy is about feelings. At root, it's about how you feel. And that's a, that's a nebulous and difficult thing to do. I didn't sing it, you're welcome. Um, um, but it's hard to get around that idea of the, the, something rooted in an emotion. And the emotion is really about a fear. It's a fear of what other people might say about you. And the truth is, you never hear them say it. You fear them saying it. So you're projecting what you think they're gonna say about you. And that's the kind of tangle we end up with when we discuss privacy. I think we need to discuss harm and what really goes wrong so we know what to protect against. And it can go extreme. I love this quote from a privacy advocate who said that privacy is control over who can see us, hear us, touch us, smell us, and get this, taste us. In some control over anyone who can sense us. If we really believe that, we all become the Unabomber. Right? We live around no one because any interaction with anyone else is a violation of privacy. That would be a very sad and wrong society. That's why I want to protect publicness and not let this go too far. So a bad definition of privacy is control. Control of what, who, where. If I have data that's, that joins into the worlds, who owns it then, the crowd or me? These are difficult concepts. The worst definition of privacy I know is creepy. And of course, made all the more famous by your executive chairman, talking about the creepy line which you do, in fact, try to avoid. But the creepy line is the most nebulous concept of all. When I go to privacy conferences and people say, well, you can't do that, that's creepy. I say, stop, define creepy. 
What does creepy really mean? Well, it means I don't like it. Okay, but what does that mean specifically? And we cannot come up with regulation and legislation based around the notion of creepiness. Dana Boyd, brilliant researcher. You all know Dana? Dana at, at Microsoft and Harvard Berkman Center, but now coming to NYU. A brilliant researcher who actually works with young people on privacy. She schooled me in the notion that what we should be talking about is the gathering of data versus the use of data. If you try to shut off the gathering of data, it's an impossible game of whack-a-mole. If I walk into Bob's office, apply, no, I'll walk, you're my age, so if I walk into Trey's office applying for a job, Trey can see immediately, based on my prematurely gray hair, my approximate age, my race, my gender, where I'm from, probably some level hit about my education, even though I talk really fast, um, and so on. And I can't stop you from knowing that. You may choose not to hire me because of my prematurely gray hair. And you'll get away with it, because nobody knows you did that. But if you do it again and again and again and again, obviously there's a pattern, and you'll get sued. We regulate the use of the information. I can't make you forget that I have gray hair. I can't make you not know what you know. Yet, that's how we regulate much of this these days. Pharmaceutical companies aren't allowed to, don't, their lawyers say that they can't listen to their patients for fear of learning things and not reacting properly. So we have a, you know, a ridiculous three monkey world around this now. I came to the conclusion as I worked this through, I, I, I preferred to see privacy as an ethic, a responsibility of knowing information. If I tell Bob something, the response, it is, it is now public to that extent. And the responsibility of, of what happens to that knowledge is no longer with me, it's now with Bob. He has the responsibility of knowing my information. That's where privacy lies. And it involves a lot of ethical decisions, not stealing information, protecting my information, not letting it get stolen by anybody else. Context matters. If I tell you that I once had to wear baby Huey adult diapers, and you say that to someone, and you don't say this in the context of having prostate cancer, well, context matters. You know, he's really weird, he wears adult diapers, though I didn't want to, right? Uh, it's about giving credit and being transparent about the, what you're gonna do with the data. Many of these things come out of this idea of the responsibility of holding someone else's data. Google, I think, is the primary example of the last one here, which is to return value with the data. Right? You use our clicks and you give us our clicks back with incredible value given. Now, then the contrary is the publicness, and I think the publicness is also an ethic. It's a responsibility of sharing. The fact that I had um, prostate cancer and thyroid cancer and a heart condition all coming after 9-11. I don't, no one should force me to say that to you. No one should force me to share that. But those are data points that might be valuable in pinpointing the impact of 9-11 and being at the World Trade Center that day on our health. I don't know whether it does or not. For me to share that maybe helps someone else. For me not to share that doesn't. That's my responsibility now, my decision. And I think to share it is perhaps often an act of generosity. So sharing can be generous and transparent and authentic. I also think you have to share for a reason. If you just, the old argument about Twitter and breakfast is that no, of course, I don't wanna know everyone's breakfast. Uh, it doesn't help the world, but it might help somebody and that's fine. Uh, using standards when you share, I think we have to make government far better at using open standards. Um, I'll get to the idea, the last idea in a minute. So we go from privacy now to publicness. And what I really want to do in the book is to argue the benefits of being public. And I start with my prostate cancer. It ends with a post under the headline, the penis post. Why the hell would I share this? The most private of data about private parts. Why would I do that? I got incredible benefit out of doing so. Uh, when I posted that I had prostate cancer, uh, a friend of mine named Andrew Tyndall came in and sent me an email. And I knew Andrew. He, he analyzes network news. He's a great guy in New York. I'd known him for 10 years. I didn't know he had the operation. He didn't know that I was going to. The only way he could know it was because I was public about it. And when I did, he gave me an email that gave me incredible detail about what I would go through, more than the doctor ever would. And I was very grateful for that. He then saw, I said on my blog, that I was doing this on the blog for the benefit, and, and I use this, this phrase, of those who follow on Google. Those who search for prostate cancer on Google, they'll see a patient and they'll get some idea of what, what it is. And, and he came back in and he said, if you're gonna do it, so should I. So he left even more detail on my blog. And another guy came in and left yet more detail. 
and he did it under a pseudonym, which I fully understood and, and think that was fine. But he came back the next day and said, if you guys are doing it under your name, why shouldn't I? Kind of getting rid of the stigma, so he did it. A woman came in and talked about her husband, whom she lost to prostate cancer. He, they met later in life. He got the diagnosis. They weren't married yet. He, was, he, he said that he didn't want to get the operation because he wanted to be, in his words, a full husband to her. She said, nonsense. That's not why I'm marrying you. Nonetheless, he waited too long. She lost him. So she left this story. Friends of mine have come and said they got their PSA checked. You're all a little too young, but except for that one exception. But you should all get your PSA checked at the right age. Uh, these things are curable. Uh, so these are the benefits that I got out of talking about this most private thing. Zuck's law, which I'm sure you all know, is that last, this year we'll share twice as much as last year and next year twice as much again. Uh, 750 million people, or 800 million is the number, doing this on Facebook. How many are on Google Plus now? No, I don't know. I mean, how many people total? Uh, can't say. You can't, Jesus. How many has been guessed? Okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, I forget where I am. Yeah, yeah, sh yeah, sure, openness and publicness. Yeah, my ass. Uh, <laughs> all right, 750 million people on Facebook uh, aren't doing this because they're insane or drunk most of the time. Right? They're doing it for a reason. They're sharing a billion artifacts of their lives every day in the form of photos and videos on Facebook alone. Right? I, I think this number is now outdated. Uh, how many tweets there are a day, how many photos on Facebook, uh, how many hours of video. I would add in a slide here about the use of Google+, Plus, but I don't know anything. Right? So publicness has all these benefits. Right? It, it, it enables relationships. You can sit home alone all day and never go out and you won't know what you miss. It enables collaboration, clearly, and trust. It disarms the myth of perfection, and, and that really was an honest-to-God typo, uh, and I left it in there anyway. Um, uh, but th the industrial age gives this idea that, that everything we do has to be complete and finished when we do it. Obviously, you and your culture of beta here at Google know the opposite. That, no, we're better off to release things undone. And I always say that's a statement of humility and humanity, even from Google, to do that. And that being public about the process enables the collaboration. It neutralizes stigmas. I argue that um, uh, gays and lesbians in this country had as their best weapon publicness. And no one should force anyone out of the closet. But those who had the courage to step out of the closet and say to the bigots who'd forced them there, you got a problem with this, as we say in New Jersey, uh, beat back the stigma. And there wasn't a stigma anymore, or there isn't near as much of a stigma because of their publicness and the bravery that that took. It grants at least credit for what we do. It powers the wisdom of the crowd. It organizes us, protects us, and again, creates value. So publicness has many, many benefits, and I would like to concentrate on those in the discussion instead of always the dangers of violations of privacy. We come to Jürgen Habermas. Who had to study Habermas in school? My sympathy, number one. Number two, correct me when I get this wrong, because I'm no Habermas scholar. Uh, you read him in English, you might as well read him in German, because it makes as much sense. Uh, but Habermas argued that the public sphere did not come into existence until the mid-18th century, when um, rational, critical debate in coffee houses and salons led to a balance to government power in, in Europe. Uh, and fine. However, a bunch of scholars at, at McGill and elsewhere in Canada came up with an idea of the, of the, that we had the tools to make publics before that that when 3,000 people gathered at the Globe Theater to hear Richard the, I always confuse, is the bad Richard Richard the second or Richard the third? Third, thank you very much, I knew, I did know. Um, who needs Google when I have smart people? Um, Richard the third, that forms a public around this idea of what you do when you have an incompetent ruler. Uh, sorry, it's not me going insane, it's a bug. Uh, maps created publics in the sense that you started to have some boundaries around who you are. The Gutenberg Bible and the Gutenberg press printing and the whole idea of the book created publics. Printed sermons created publics. Art. All these things were tools to create publics before Habermas's grand public sphere in the 18th century. And what I like about this notion is that it's not one public sphere. It is many public spheres, many publics that are created through these tools. Some academics at the University of Southern Denmark came up with this wonderful notion of the Gutenberg parenthesis. And they argue that before the parenthesis, our knowledge was oral and scribal and shared mouth to mouth or scribe to scribe. 
that was remixed along the way. It emphasized process over product. It often had patrons rather than markets. It was anonymous. There wasn't a sense of authorship and ownership. And it was about protecting ancient knowledge better than encouraging current knowledge, modern knowledge. In the Gutenberg parenthesis, right, the textual made us think in a linear fashion. Uh, McLuhan says that the sentence, and this sentence is an example of this, is a straight line. And that's the way we tend to think. Things have a beginning and an end. They are authored. They are owned. They're permanent. They're one way. They're products. Now we come back out to the modern end, they argue, of the, of the, of the Gutenberg parenthesis. And we, I'm not saying that we return to what it was before, but, but some of the traits are similar. It's more oral. Passed, or knowledge is passed around person to person. It's remixed along the way. It's collaborative. It's about process versus product. It's about a freaking bug. Um, uh, it's conversational. And so this changes. I'm sorry. I really don't want to drive me nuts. You can't see it, but I swear it's here. I, it really is here. Uh, so this, this idea that we, we, we changed, what, what they argued is that when we came into the Gutenberg parenthesis, it confused the shit out of people. It was very troubling. It changed the way they looked at the world. And now that we come out on the other end, it's an equally disturbing transition. And that's what we're seeing when we see fear about technology. And that's a fear that none of us in this room, uh, I, I think, live, but we see it out there. It affects what we do. It affects our lives. So as we look at, at, at publics, I think we have to look at the internet as a public place, as a, as a way of making publics. You know, Tahrir Square is the public sphere indeed, brought to life. What encourages me so much now about this age is that a public can have its true voice, that they can connect with each other on the internet. I always, uh, Doc Searles, co-author of the Clutre Manifesto, taught me not to call the internet a medium because it brings with it then all of the baggage that a medium has. And he says it's more like a place. Um, the um, CTO of the Veterans Administration calls the internet the eighth continent. Uh, I was at Sarkozy's EG8, and I used that phrase, and Sarkozy rather liked it. And I, and I, I think it might be a mistake, because I think he saw himself having lost Quebec um, with, with going to a continent and putting his flag in it and claiming dominion over it. So cotton may be a, a, a bad metaphor. We don't know what it is yet. Elizabeth Eisenstein, who is the key Gutenberg scholar, says that the book did not take on its own form until 50 years after it was invented by Gutenberg. Um, that, of course, when it was created, the fonts were, were made to mimic the scribe's handwriting. Indeed, printing was originally called automatic handwriting. Right? Horseless carriage, automatic handwriting. We view the future with the legacy of the past, the analog of the past. We're certainly seeing that today. We see publishers come in, and they see the tablet, and they think, oh, goody, it brings back the past that the link stole from me, control over my product. We're putting old wine in new casks. And so I don't think we know what this public looks like yet. And that's why I want to so much protect it, because look at the amazing things it can do. And no, I'm not arguing that this revolution was caused and executed on Twitter and Facebook and Google and so on. But certainly these tools were helpful and did manage people to come together. And your colleague, Will Gonim, thanked Facebook for a reason, because its existence enabled things to happen. There are also radically public companies. Uh, have anybody heard of uh, Local Motors? It's a pretty amazing uh, company. Uh, in, my, in, in the last book, the, the Google Kiss-Ass book, uh, I, um, I talked about the notion of a collaborative car. And people made fun of me afterwards and said, that's ridiculous. You're going to end up with a Homer. You know the Homer? It was Homer Simpson's car, right? It had, uh, Homer's, the Homer had two bubbles. The kids were in a bubble, so you couldn't hear them with restraints. It had uh, hundreds of, of cup holders. And um, uh, it bankrupted uh, Homer's, I think, cousin's car company. So they said, if you have collaboration in cars, that's absurd on its face. It just can't happen. Local Motors publishes openly all the designs for its cars. It uses some off-the-shelf, a lot of off-the-shelf stuff, but they also um, uh, make products. So in this car, this is called the Rally Fighter, the tail light there, uh, it was an open design. It was a competition. The designer won. Then they had to go in and do specific parts, and they did the tail light, and um, uh, whoever designed it did a great job, and the whole community said, oh, we love it. We've got to have it. The CEO of the company, Jay Rogers, came in and said, I love it too. I just want to tell you, if I have to tool up to make that tail light, we'll add $1,000 to the price of every car. And the community said as one, never mind. 
and they went looking through other parts and they settled on a Honda taillight lens, which is this, uh, for I think $70, $70. And no one would guess, I wouldn't guess that's from Honda. So the public, given the opportunity and the respect by dealing in public with the company was able to make economic and design decisions, which I find just amazing. So we, we, we have this notion that companies can and should operate publicly. We're making decisions now about whether to operate in a walled or open world, private or public, opaque or transparent, closed or open, controlled or free. These are the choices that we have. So almost at the end here, Privacy has its advocates. It has tons of advocates, very qualified advocates, loud advocates, advocates who've done a very good job of fighting for privacy. And I'm not fighting against them. I will fight against their excesses, but I won't fight against them. Publicness also needs its advocates. And I would urge you from Google and you from the community of the net to be the best advocates of publicness. And that's why I wanted to be here. Who will protect our publicness. Is it governments? Well, no, because this thing, this internet needs to be independent of those governments. And if we give power to one government, we give it to all governments. So the Australian government is looking to put in filters, as you probably know, to, in, in order to get child porn, will enable them to filter anything and everything. And if they can do that, so can Ahmadinejad, so can China. And so we have to worry about the open and free architecture of the net. Will companies protect it? Well, I'm a Google fanboy one more time. I was critical in my last book of Google's stance on China. I was glad to see the change come about. We could argue about the circumstances, but I, I, I agree with the change. Um, and, and I think that in that case, Google was operating as the net's ambassador to the world and stood on its principles. But Eric Schmidt says that Google is not a country, does not have diplomats, except for Dave Drummond, um, and does not have laws, and does not have police, and does not have armies, and it's not a country. We shouldn't put Google in that position to be a country. And in essence, we did in this case. No other company that was hacked stood beside Google. No government really stood beside Google. Google stood alone against China on this. And I salute Google for that. But then Google turned around and did what I would call a devil's deal with Verizon on net neutrality, and created what I would call the, the split between fixed and mobile is the internet and the Schmidt internet. And that's not a Schmidt joke, it's a Yiddish joke. Um, some misinterpret. Uh, and, and so Google, I, I don't blame Google for doing that in the sense that, that it's a company and it has interest with phone companies and it needed to get the best it could in the discussion with Verizon. But the point here is that should we put the responsibility for protecting the entire internet and all its freedom on this company? No, Google doesn't want that responsibility, nor should we give it that responsibility. So who's gonna do it? We have to, we the citizens of the net. Al Franken said at South by Southwest, it's time for us to use the internet to save the internet. And I think that's true. Have all you've seen John Perry Barlow's Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace? I mean, it is a magnificent document, over the top as hell. Uh, I tried to get him to do a dramatic reading of it once. Uh, you know, on behalf of the, of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You have no sovereignty where we gather. It is purple prose at its best, but it's stirring. And it says that you have no sovereignty here because we didn't give it to you. Indeed, the internet is the internet because no one has sovereignty over it. That is precisely what makes it what it is. That's precisely what makes it frightening to governments and companies. So I had the hubris to come up with a, my own principles. Now, these are wrong. I'll say they are absolutely wrong off the front. But I think we need a discussion of principles of an open and public society and the net. Because we need something to point to when someone does something wrong. We need something to point to to give companies cover when it comes to making decisions like net neutrality. Um, I went to the EG8, as I said, in, in Paris, because I kind of snuck in. And I had the temerity to stand up and ask Sarkozy a question in the first plenary. And I asked him to take a Hippocratic oath for the net. First, do no harm. And he dismissed me in a very French way. Pah, he said. You call it harm to protect your privacy and your children and your copyright? You call this harm? This is not harm. He said, ask me a tough question. Oh, no problem, I'll take your pledge. But of course, he can do a lot of harm. Governments can do a lot of harm to the net. Um, you have the three-strike rule in France now uh, that kicks people off for piracy. 
Here in the U.S., you look at things like COPPA, the Children's Online Prote Privacy Protection Act, which is by all means a worthy cause, but there are unintended consequences to what government does. For one thing, on the internet now, as you know, COPPA means that you can't serve a child under 13 unless you have the parent's explicit permission. They're now going to change the rules so the parent can't give that on email. They have to uh, receive, print out, sign, and scan a document or get on a video conference with the company to say, yeah, that's my kid. It's just, it's, so what, what happens here? There's, there's unintended consequences. Number one, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog and everyone is 14, right? Every kid knows to lie, right? Uh, I asked the attorney at the FTC uh, whether they knew the rate of truth and they, they had no idea or how often parents use this. They have no idea. Uh, these are unintended, the other unintended consequence is that I think children are ill-served on the internet. Who should be better served than young children? But I know that one of the first sites I started online in 95 was the yuckiest site on the internet about bugs and goo and things aimed at children with the Liberty Science Center. My company said after COPPA came out, we're never doing that again. The risk is too great. So children are underserved. These are the unintended consequences. So we need principles, I think, to be able to point to. And again, these are the wrong ones. I, I would love a discussion. Uh, I love a way to talk about what these are, but, but we start with the notion of a right to connect. And I don't mean necessarily that we follow Finland and give everyone broadband, though I think it would be a damn good idea. But at least if you are cut off from the internet, I think we should now agree that that is a violation of your human rights. When Mubarak cut off citizens from the net, he violated their human rights. That is a preamble to our First Amendment, the right to speak. And fo what follows from that is the right to connect and act. Um, I talk about publicness and privacy. I think our institution's information should become um, open by default and, and closed only by necessity. It's the opposite today. In governments, their data are open, uh, are, are closed by default and open by force. Um, we have to have this nation, notion that what's public is a public good. When Germany tells Google it may not take photos or pressures them not to take photos, of a public view from a public space. We have diminished what is public, and that steals from the public. We have to stand up for and defend the notion of what is public, what is public information and public views and public knowledge. All bits are created equal, whether it's Mubarak killing the internet or China killing a search or Comcast killing a movie. Uh, those all affect, if, no, if one bit is not free, no bits are guaranteed to be free. And finally, the internet's architecture is what makes it the internet and it has to stay that way. So that's my spiel. Um, the book goes into a lot of you know, history and, and other things to go on, but what the real point of it at the end is just that, is that I think we, the citizens of the net, must defend the openness of the net. And that if we don't, it's in danger. It's in danger not only from bad players, Mubarak, but also from good and well-meaning players who think that technology is causing a new problem in society, privacy, bullying, things like that. And so the solution to that is to regulate the technology rather than the behavior. We already have the laws to regulate the behavior. Technology is not ruining society. You and I know that, but we've gotta get out there and do a better job of changing the tone of this conversation from protecting privacy, still important, still must do it, we also must protect publicness. So I'm happy to have arguments uh, and anything at all. That's my spiel. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to run around. Can I just run around with the mic? Is that All right? There's this horrible first moment where nobody puts up their hand, nobody argues. Anybody? Bob, you got it. All right, I'll do Bob first. Yeah, well, first, if I could make a comment and then, then a question, actually. I think you know of Vannevar Bush's article in July 1945, Atlantic Monthly, in which he essentially first described what became hypertext and, and the web. In the same article, interestingly enough, he writes that the camera hound of the future wears on his forehead a lump a little larger than a walnut. It takes pictures. And he goes on to describe essentially how in the future um, people will be like the Google um, uh, the Google guys you said were walking around taking pictures everywhere they go and making everything public. But um, it's intriguing that that was in the same, uh, the same article that essentially described the internet. But you wrote a book, um, you know, what would Google do? Okay, and, and that sort of constantly makes those of us at Google, I think, ask the question, what should Google do? So let me ask you a question. What would Jarvis do? 
Imagine that you were given control of, say, Google's engineering resources for a year. Okay, Larry Page just steps aside and says, Jarvis is a cool guy. <laughs> we'll just let him tell us what to do. So to, to, to get, to, what, what, can, what would you do with Google to, uh, to make the world a better place and to, to better, uh, better fulfill the ideas you've got? I was at Tumblr yesterday, and they kind of asked a different question, which is, okay, what do we do? You know, we get developers, what do we do? And, and, and I think that the first step is to create a lot of open platforms, and truly open. And, and I, on this week in Google, I'm one of the, among those who argues that Android is basically open. There, you know, there's a lot of back and forth, you all know that. But I think that that openness is what has led to all the development that's happened, and leads to Amazon doing what it can do, and so on. So more open platforms, I think, become a key structure here. Um, there's Firefox, and it's wonderful. I, I use Chrome because Chrome is better, but the fact that Firefox exists is important. Uh, uh, and if you go back and look at the fact that Apache existed, and that the original, you know, the, the, those web servers being open mattered to all the development that followed. So I think Google can continue to and become aggressive about setting an example of openness and development. Is that an answer? Thank you for coming in. Oh, thank um, you. So I work uh, with a lot of our healthcare advertisers, and I think that's an industry that's particularly conservative when it comes to sharing online. Um, I'm curious, from your personal experiences, maybe what were some of your, you know, in the decision that you made to post, you know, and make public your your disease, um, and kind of how you decided to ultimately do it, and then maybe if there were some surprising consequences that came out of it, positive mm -hmm. or negative, mm -hmm. that you weren't anticipating? Yeah. Um, uh, there's a couple layers to that. I'll get up here for the convenience of the thing. There's a couple layers to that, I think. One is a data layer, right? And, and, and Google flu trends is valuable and, and matters. And was it, I don't know if it was Larry or Sergey who said that, that it could save billions of lives in, in the next pandemic. Uh, you know which one said that? Which one, Sergey? Sergey, thank you very much. Um, and maybe a little hyperbole in that number, but, but not in the spirit of it, that having that data public, uh, and it was said in the context, as I remember, of not killing uh, legacy search results, search queries, so that you could, you could now see the, the, the differences that, that came up and, and, and do that. We have to be no longer, well, let me, let me answer your question further, then I'll, then I'll get my conclusion. I've seen nothing bad that's come from mine. One guy who didn't like me anyway, named Mark Derry, uh, wrote a post arguing that I was oversharing. And oversharing is a very weird concept, right? What he's basically saying is, shut up. I don't want you to say this. Well, that's my free speech. The problem here is not oversharing, it's overlistening. Don't follow me, right? It's a perfect architecture. If you don't like someone, the point of telling them not to say it is ridiculous. Telling them, them you don't like them is just to be trollish. Don't listen, unfollow, very simple. So the information is out there, and I think it should be out there. Um, and it creates an example. Just two nights ago, on Google+, which I'm an active user of, approaching 100,000, proud of that, thank you. Uh, love the, the depth of the discussion. Don't like some of the spammers. By the way, there's a new spam trick is to, is to create a fake circle and put like two legit people in there and put a bunch of spams in there and try to get people to spread it around. And so I, 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 on Google+, Plus today, I said to Matt Cutts, you know, whack that mole. Um, but because I can see when people mention me, this guy came in two nights ago and he said, Jeff Jarvis inspired me to talk about my health. I wasn't sure whether to do it or not, but he goes through a long story of his gallbladder and liver. He barely escaped death and the surgeon. He comes out of that and now he has some strange malady. His head, head feels like it's exploding all the time. The doctors are saying, we don't know what it is, get used to it. And he's saying, no, that's not acceptable. I don't know what to do. The only thing I can think of is to go to the public. So I commented on that and then I, I of course, shared it. And I shared it on Google Plus and I shared it on Twitter as well. And people came in with answers. Now some, of course, ridiculous grapefruit cures, a lot that's gonna be useless to him, but it's new paths that he can pursue. He can go find a different kind of doctor. He doesn't even know what kind of doctor to ask for. So the fact that if I really did inspire him to do that, I take great joy in that. Well, why don't we do this more often? The problem is stigma. Right? The problem is we're looking at the wrong end of this. Health stuff is extremely private. Why is it private? Because we have fears. We have pe people, fears who are gonna say, they're gonna look at me and now know 
that I've been incontinent and impotent. So I have to get over that fear and say, what's the big deal? Right? They're going to look at you and say, I'm not going to hire you, or I'm not going to insure you. Well, that goes to like Dana Boyd's point about Trey not hiring me because I'm gray-haired. The problem there is not the sharing of the data. The problem there is how we, what we do with it as a society. We have problems there. To my mind, it becomes pretty straightforward that if we all shared our health data, that good would come of it, period. You would find other people have gone through the same thing. You would find correlations and data that you couldn't find otherwise. You would find um, cures out of that and causes out of that. So society's problem here is that we have made sickness into a stigma. That is a big problem for all of us, right? It's wrong. It's just clearly on its face wrong. It's not your fault you're sick. Well, if you smoke, it is. But, you know, other than that, it's not your fault. And so, uh, and I used to, and so I know if, I, God forbid, I get a, a hat trick of cancer now, um, I, I'll have myself to blame. Um, but other than that, it's what happens to you. And so I think we have to encourage openness. Now, finally, to the, to the problem that, that the farmer companies have, as I said, is that the law is set up in such a way that they cannot hear their patients talking because if a patient says something and they don't act on it properly right away, they're more liable. We have Section 235 on the Internet, which enables forums to exist without liability to the host because we want the host to encourage conversation. We've got to have that same spirit when it comes to health. So I think you know, I was delighted when Google was going where it was with Google Health. I put up my stuff there. May it rest in peace. It, the world wasn't ready for it. There's a new service in Germany I just heard about that's called uh, Second Opinion. Uh, it's Feitemeinung.com uh, or something, where you can put up your x-rays and put up other things, and they find other doctors to look at it for a very low cost, and you just get some more opinions. That's good. So I want to see more openness. And, 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 and the way we're going to get it, I think, is by people standing up and saying, yeah, I got a disease. You got a problem with that? Anybody else? Yeah. Thanks. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. Um, the, the media has traditionally um, self-censored when things happen in public spaces that are particularly you know, disturbing. Obviously, what happened in New York is one example, but in the, uh, an example folks might, may not be aware of, there was a um, crush at a soccer stadium in the early 1990s, I think, and people were being crushed against the barricade and dying live on camera. And the family of those people who were being killed on broadcasts were successfully sued uh, for nervous shock because the transmission of those images was so traumatic to them, even though it was fully public. Um, now we, as you know, I think 35 hours of content is uploaded to YouTube every hour. We don't pre-screen it. But there are some videos that appear that, are, that happen in public places. Um, are potentially important, but are extremely disturbing to folks who recognise the people in the video. And I believe the current policy is that you do have, if you are identified in the video, you're able to request that be taken down, even if it happens in a public place. That's a very, that, that's a very difficult issue for us to deal with, and mm -hmm. I just was interested in your perspective on, on that issue. It is difficult. You all know Andy Carvin? Anybody not know Andy Carvin here? Okay, so Andy Carvin, has done a magnificent job of, of tweeting and retweeting the Arab Spring. That includes very grotesque videos that are necessary to find the horrendous things that tyrants are doing. And so he warns every time he links to it, but he says, I want to find out if this is legit. Did it seem to happen where it happened? Does anybody seen this before? Is this new? And he links to these things, but he links to them with caveats. If we did not have those views of these horrendous things that have been going on, you know, what brought the world to the people of Libya? Partly, it was seeing what was happening to the people of Libya. Um, I understand the desire not to full well. I was at the World Trade Center on 9-11. The thing that I never talk about is seeing the people fall. I just, I, I, that's more than I've ever said. Because I do think there's almost a privacy to those people, and this is their end, and I'm not going to talk about it. I hate the pictures of that, despise the pictures of that. Uh, but, and, 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 and it's in Google's right. Google is not government, so you can limit what you do. It's not censorship when you do it. It's censorship is what government does. So you can have a policy that says, we don't want this on our service for whatever reason, and that's fine. But I think that if we tried to make that a norm of all society, we'd have a mistake. So if, 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 there, were, if there were images of someone being lynched in the South 
in the 60s, or even the images that were of, of fire hoses against African Americans in, in, in the 60s. Those were disturbing images, but they were necessary to get out. The images of the Vietnam War, where people died, were necessary to get out, so we knew what was going on. So my instinct is to stay with the truth and keep it out there. Um, and I guess the way I would handle it if I were Google is warnings and caveats. Um, does someone have a right to ask for it to come down? Well, that goes to what um, uh, Evelyn, uh, uh, Vivian Redding, Redding, I forget her first name, uh, Commissioner Redding at the EU is talking about four pillars of the internet uh, regulation, and one of them is the right to forget. That's a very, very disturbing notion. Right? And you know it at Google. People come to you, governments come to you and say, countries are now coming to you and say, take this down, because someone had a right to forget. Well, if I took the video that's taken down, that's now affected my free speech. It's affected my First Amendment in this country. And so there are two sides to this at all times. So if the family is there and wants it taken down, and the person who took it does not object, I have no objection to taking it down. But if the person who took it said, no, this reveals police brutality, this reveals something going on, there's no presumed right of privacy in public even with this, I think you're in a very difficult position. Finally, there's an argument going on right now in fe uh, federal appeals court in Chicago uh, over uh, Illinois eavesdropping law where um, Richard Posner argued the other day, uh, police in Chicago, even in public, doing their public duty, the law now says, according to current reading, that they have a right not to be recorded. I find that abhorrent. Um, Posner said, well, if we, if we change this, if we allow it to happen, then all these journalists and bloggers are going to go around snooping. Well, no, I call that accountability and, and reporting. These are public acts. So I think we can't pr presume a right to privacy in public. Public is public, and it will bring with it hard times. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the case where doctors couldn't find the solution and then uh, the person went public. But there is also another argument where people, if patients start sharing and talking to each other, what might happen is they might ignore what the doctors are telling them and start you doing things that other patients are telling them. And treatments are very personalized and yes. sicknesses. So how, how can you like... Well, I, I think that 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 goes to doctors being curators. Right? So the best weapon that a doctor has against misinformation is to help get you to the good information. And instead what they do is they hold information to themselves. So we have to change the ethic, I think, of the doctor to say that, that it's your body and we should share more with you. I mean, I, I've had to beat stuff out of doctors to explain things to me, right? We all have. You're too dumb to know this. This is my job. Let me do it. Well, no, damn it. I, I want to know this. So I think that's, that, that, that we have a problem with the ethic here. And so the doctor's response should be more openness of their good stuff. I asked my, my surgeon at Sloan Kettering, I, 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 got a, I gave him the last book, he got all excited about blogging, I said, you should blog. He said, yes, I should blog. Sloan Kettering won't let him. I, I don't know why, liability or whatever, but that's wrong. He has knowledge, the right knowledge, I hope, since he was my surgeon, um, that could help people. But here Sloan Kettering is keeping him from doing that. That's ridiculous, right? That's the kind of openness we need to fight for to say that. Now, in terms of misinformation, yes, you know better than anybody. You point to misinformation every second. It's all around. It's the world. Part of the problem we have here is I think that we start to presume that we in media look at the net, the, the web, in our own image, godlike, as if it is a medium. And it's packaged and, and, and edited and all that. It's not, clearly. It's just life. It's Times Square. So I think we have to also train people that, of course, there are idiots and bozos and dangerous people out there. And you need to figure out better yourself and need to figure out what's going on. But this guy who went on, all he really wanted was, what kind of doctor do I ask for? Give me another path. Uh, so I, I think that, yes, those dangers are there. But just because the dangers are there doesn't mean we shouldn't have openness and sharing. So there's a, a traditional sort of a good government can't that uh, we need to have more openness and transparency and have uh, public hearings and negotiations like in the current uh, debt negotiations. But there's a lot of people who argue that um, putting cameras into Congress has actually dumbed down the, the argument there that um, as bad a name as the back smoky rooms have, uh, that's where stuff gets done and you don't have to sort of posture and uh, say the right things that your constituents want to hear you can actually, you know, uh, get that half a loaf compromise in the back right. room. Um, 
So how do you balance the need for publicness and the need for the government to be open with the need for privacy in order to get stuff done? I was just looking this morning. There is an open government conference in, in Berlin going on today, and uh, the wife of um, Daniel Domscheit-Berg, uh, Ante Domscheit, I guess his name is, uh, was, was blogging the, um, one of the members of the Icelandic parliament, as you know, they're rewriting the Constitution in public. They took Facebook comments into consideration for rewriting the Constitution. They have open information laws, open government laws. It, and somebody came back in Twitter later and said, it, it, you know, it ain't the clean fried egg you think it is. It's an omelet, right, which is government. And I know that. So you're right. You need to be able to do both. Um, but I do think that, that and, and the bigger question you're asking is also, when the camera is on any of us, do we become more fake? Do we perform? This goes to Zuckerberg's one identity argument, which I agree with him on, that we do have one identity, and when we try to fake an identity, we'll be found out to be hypocritical. Um, so that are, are politicians hypocritical? <laughs> yeah, and we all know that. Um, so I think it starts with open, we can't go and read the laws they're writing. That's absurd. We don't, we don't see the data that is gathered on our behalf with our money, we can't find that. So I think you make that part of government open first so that we have a level playing field with the politicians of data and information. I think that's critical here. Um, then, when are we gonna have the moment when we elect someone truly from the internet? We have not had a net candidate first. The first non-network candidate we've had, non-political party, you know, are, are a Tea Party, really. Uh, but that's not of the net, that's of Fox News. So I think we have to start electing new kinds of people who are, are, can get away with being honest. Uh, you first, then the book. So my question kind of goes along with that, uh, but at a, at a more personal level. You, uh, you and Gina had a discussion on Twig this week about- Thank you for uh, watching. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, putting the person online that your grandma thinks you are. Right. Uh, right. Can you talk a little bit about that and how um, you know, our identities online can be shaped and affected uh, by what other people are posting, right. uh, as well as you know, the image we're trying to purvey that is ourself, but may not come off like that to some casual onlooker. Right, and, and, and the argument here is that we water down ourselves because we know we're in public, and so we become less than we really are and less authentic than we really are. Uh, you know, I'm a Howard Stern fan, and I think that he, he inspired the title, and I also dedicated it to him on the same page with my parents, which my mother didn't like very much. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I, I tend to believe that we need to get more and more open, but, but Gina's right. You, you, you know, her friend said that I, the, the person you see on the net is the person I feel okay with my grandmother seeing. But then we talked further, and, and, and Gina is a married lesbian, and I said, 30 years ago, and she, said, and she knew where I was going, and she said, you're right, I wouldn't have told my grandmother that I was gay 30 years ago, but now I can. So I think part of this is the more open you get incrementally, the more we have an open society and the better off we are. Um, but this goes to the other question, the other argument about the multiple identities, that you have a work identity and a home identity and a, and a this identity and a that identity. And of course, you operate differently in these contexts. But at some point, you're the real you. Right? And, and the argument that you're a, a corrupt Enron executive who also is a really good churchgoer, well, no, one of those is clearly false because he's an unethical scum, right? And there's still a true identity. And when we get in trouble is not when our work identity goes against our party identity, it's when our outside identity conflicts with our inside identity and we're shown to be hypocritical. Uh, yes, we do this in awareness of people seeing us, but I think at some point the argument is we will be more authentic and be more honest because we can get caught up. Uh, in the book I quoted, um, what's her name? The party, uh, she goes to all the parties, Kate. Um, yes, Julia Allison. Uh, I knew you'd know. Uh, Julia Allison, who's famous for being really public, uh, and, and kind of an interesting story because she kind of regrets it in a way, but that's how she makes her living now, is being very, very public. But she said, I can't get away with lies. You know, I'm gonna get Botox, and everybody's gonna know I get Botox. Right? So I think that's generally a good thing for society. Finally, the problem of the teacher who's seen on Facebook holding the beer. Right? What's the problem there? I think she gets fired. Well, what's wrong there? Drinking? No. Being on Facebook? No. Seen on Facebook? No. It's the asshole principal who fires her who probably drinks beer too. And it's not like it's the law to drink beer, there's nothing wrong with it, right? So our problem here, again, we have to attack the norms and behaviors of society, not the technology for thinking that it's now corrupted everything and that it's changed us. So I think we will become, I hope we will become more and more authentic. Now, every technology is neutral. It could make us all more false. It could be used for more corruption. It could be used for more uh, uh, 
tyranny. That's all possible. But I have faith in my fellow man and woman that we will try to use it for the, for the good. Yeah. Time or no? Uh, no we, have oh, time for... oh, we do. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Both. Uh, so I think you went to press uh, just before the whole what's been called the NIM Wars controversy right. came up. And so I'm, I'm curious, in the context of your book, you know, where you might have gone with, uh, with that whole issue. I support anonymity um, um, vehemently. Right? We need anonymity for whistleblowers and for vulnerable people and for people in tyrannies, and so I support that. Uh, pseudonymity um, is also necessary in some cases because people can, can develop a pseudonym. If you're playing World of Warcraft, you really don't want the world to know that your name is Bob and you're a dwarf. You know, it's okay to have a fake identity there. Uh, nicknames, fine. I know Dr. Kiki as Dr. Kiki, and if I can't find her on Google, Google Plus as Dr. Kiki, there's a problem there. Real identity is not the solution to everything that some people think it is. Oh, if you're under your real name, you're gonna be okay then. Well, I know plenty of assholes by their names, right? Uh, and someone would call me that too, and that's fine, screw them. Um, uh, Right, so real names, I do think, I think the key insight of Facebook was real people, real relationships. And, and, and the question for Google Plus, I think, is how do you get to real people and real relationships versus, and, and is the real name the only way to get there? I don't think so. So I think enforcing only real name is a problem. I, I'm, I'm suspecting that Google feels it probably did go a little farther. I, I sense you guys feel a little trapped. Um, but I think you'll find a way out of it. I also understand that profile being, real being your real identity has incredible value past discussion in Google+, and you probably need to start showing that value and making use of that value now so that I'm motivated to use real identity there too for other reasons. Make sense? Oh. That's what I got. Okay. Okay, you said, we sh you said we should have more internet candidates, or at least we should start to have internet candidates. So, so let's say I run for Congress, I get elected, and I make a pledge, and what I do is I say, I will have no meetings with lobbyists, that are not videoed and posted to YouTube. The immediate gut reaction, I think, from a lot of people would be, yeah, that's really great. But there would be some problems, too. I probably would have fewer lobbyists willing to speak to me. Mm -hmm. They probably wouldn't be willing to give their best arguments, or what they thought would be their best arguments. I would be giving tremendous fodder to everybody who wanted to attack me for every gr grammatical error, every uh, you know, not well thought out comment I made, et cetera. Can you talk about sort of that balance, right. you know, between that 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 impetus that makes us first think, yes, that'd be wonderful if we could go check every meeting our congressman was in, but on the other side, that that uh, the knowledge that that is going to cause a lot of problems right. as what's well. sensible and what's radical. I mean, people ask me sometimes, well, are you, are you for radical transparency? And I say, well, I'm wearing clothes, aren't I? You know, and, and you're welcome. Um, no, I, not everything needs to be said. Not everything needs to be open. I, 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 when I'm asked for a sound check on radio now and they ask me for what I had for breakfast, I say that now that Twitter exists, you're not going to catch me ever saying what I had for breakfast again. So no, I don't believe that everything has to be open in that sense. But what's the spirit of openness? Would, for example, as a starting point, a law, a public log of every lobbyist you meet with, that'd be good. A summary of the meeting from you, that'd be good, right? Um, you know, something that goes towards a, a spirit of further openness that least goes in the right direction. Part of what I saw in the discussion of Iceland this morning was them saying that there's a presumption that it's too late to change, we can't change. And Iceland is saying, no, that's what we're going to try to prove wrong, is that you can change, you can try a different way. And so is the way to have the camera on everything in life? No, it's not, right? I get that. I get that that's corrupting in its own way. But is the way to have the spirit of more openness and publicness? Yeah, I hope so. so. Everyone, uh, oh, Jeff Jarvis. Thank you all. Thank you very much.